emphasis provides world class online IT training, staffing and software testing solutions to customers worldwide. H2K emphasis how we are different from our competitors. 100% job oriented training, hands on project work, cloud test lab, resume preparation and review, mock interviews, robust syllabus, one time fee and lifetime access to classes, access to recorded sessions of live classes. H2K Infosys has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kinfosys.com. From my mapper, and it will generate the key value pairs in some other form. So some collection of values have been happening for each of the key. So my club key is having or is collecting all the keys of it. So maybe mapper one is throwing three three key value pairs such as club comma one, club comma one, and club comma one. And mapper two is generating four key value pairs for club key. That means club comma one, club comma one, club comma one, club comma one. And the same way happens it for mapper three and mapper four. And after all these outputs have been generated, shuffle and sort phase, which is an inbuilt phase, or even we can have some control on it as well. But if you take the inbuilt form itself, the output would be in the form of key value pair again, which will be in the form of club comma one 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 one, which is repeated thirteen times because my input is having thirteen cards for club, right? So after this is finished, my reduce reducer will give the output. So this is what my reducer. So my reducer's action is just aggregation. So it will see what are the independent key value keys that were available till now. I mean, so there were four keys finally that was submitted to reducer. So it will see the key and then it will think of all the values that were available for it. So it will see like there were 13 ones that were available. So finally it will aggregate all these ones and it will generate as club comma 13, spade comma 13, Hard comma thirteen and diamond comma thirteen, but what happens with this shuffle and sort? How it is going to produce all these outputs? And what if the case I am having more than one reducer and all those things we will discuss. Okay, but right now just understand the straightforward and the simpler way. So, anyone has any questions on this, or can can I go ahead? Okay, cool. Okay, so if you see my reduce here, it is having the key, the same list of K2 here that is given to K2 here as well. But here it is having the list of all values that is related to that particular K2 key. So, it is having all the list of values that is related to a particular club key. And finally, reducer is giving the final output as K3, V3. So, this is what K3, V3, club, 13. So, now let's talk something about input splits as well, okay. Uh, this is a new term which we haven't heard till now, right? Because till now, what we all know is there will be some input data that it will be divided into chunks of blocks and these blocks will be stored into our HDFS blocks. So that is what our physical division is. How the blocks have, will be getting stored in HDFS, what the replication factor, all those things 
okay we are aware of it but still we just know about this physical division but once this map reduce concept comes into picture in the sense once the processing starts there will be some one second okay sorry okay there will be some intermediate or internal logic in our framework such that the input data is being divided into input splits and these input splits will be actually given as input to our mapper function so our mapper function will not read these blocks it can understand only the input splits a block and split is nothing but almost it will be having of the same size but if you think in some other way a block is a yes, a kind of physical division whereas the input split is a kind of logical division so there is something called as input format and this particular input format is responsible for creating the input splits so once if any input file is given to job tracker the job tracker will go back to this input format and it is uh, it will ask them to create the required input splits for that particular file or block so once the input splits are available it will count like how many splits totally i have and such that i can view these input splits to my mapper so for example if that functionality has be uh, has generated four input splits then job tracker will decide like okay i got four input split for this particular amount of chunk of data so i have to create four mapper tasks such that each mapper task will read this input split so an input format is just responsible let me write it Okay, so if you read this, an input format is responsible for creating the input splits. But still, these input splits are not having, or it doesn't hold the actual data. Okay, so it is just like a reference to your actual block. So it will tell you like, okay, read this block from this position to this position only, and process it only to this area. And then next, the next mapper task will read from the next position to. until some other next position it doesn't go with block by block but still the framework or the input format will try its best such that the whole 64 mb of block will come under a single split so it will try its best to make that input split as best as possible such that the block size and the input size will be almost same it will hold almost same so if you see this diagram you will understand much more clearer so there is some record or some text of a line 
that is given with in my input file. So if you consider is I am having block boundaries till here. So I am having 1, 2, 3 and 4. So totally 1 block, 2 and then some part of another block that is totally 3 blocks I am having. But if you read it in the, fine, in the form of records, my first block boundary so my first block boundary is ending somewhere in between the record itself. It's not reading the total fifth record, right? So it is somewhere losing some information. So that is the reason a new concept has been introduced called as input splits. So what this input split will do is it will read till the fifth end of block that is to this position and it will give the same value to the first mapper. So it will think like once it reaches this block boundary it will see that the block have been finished but still the record haven't been finished. So what it does is it will store the memory location till the end of the fifth record into at one position and it will give all these inputs to the mapper task. So what my mapper task does is it will read from the record 1 to end of record 5 and it will process the whole data and again now another map will come here again uh, let me take my screen snap here so from here to here my mapper one executes okay. again here to here mapper two executes and so on. This is what actually happens internally. So the reason why it is trying its best to make the block boundary very nearer to the input split is okay, uh, can anyone give me a quick guess on it why we are trying our best to have the same block boundary and as well with the same input split end also. Any reason? Um, is, is it because uh, to minimize uh, transfer of data between nodes? Perfect, for exactly. The, for, the, for the remaining records? Right, right. You are perfect, yes. That is the reason because it has to transfer the data internally. For example, if you see my mapper 1, uh, this whole block boundary, the first block boundary, will stay on one machine itself that is not divided into different machines, right? So the whole block will be divided into single machine, machine one only. So what this map task will try is, or whatever framework will try our best is, it will see that there is no maximum of data transfer between machines. So it will try its best to make the block size as 64 MB and the whole 64 MB will be going into one single map itself. But if any case, that if that is not possible, there is no other option. It has to move the data. So some data movement will be there definitely, internally. So what happens is,
Okay, let's drop it here. We can discuss much more. Okay, once the split is calculated, the client sends to the job tracker and using this storage locations, the job tracker will assign the map tasks to run it in the corresponding task trackers. So that is what actually happens. So if I take a new program or maybe some other Let's see how the data movement happens or something, okay? Imagine this is your laptop or client. Okay. Now, This is my whole cluster. On your laptop, you will write a program, right? So you have some program with you. and it will be converted into jar file right so once you write your program you will uh, export all your data into the form of a jar right so we had seen that in our hdfs uh, readings and writings as well so what we did is we have converted into a jar file the whole program is converted into jar file and then only we can execute that program in our terminals so the whole program is converted into a jar file but if you take this in our map reduces, the whole jar file will contain there is some mapper class and there is some reducer class and again to run this there will be one more main class. So these are the three classes or three programs that will that I will write independently and I will club all these things into a single jar file and that jar file is my program.jar file. Now I will give this program.jar file as an input to my job tracker right because job tracker is the guy or he is the master who will process all the jar files right. Okay, now let's imagine that I have three data nodes in my cluster. And on each data node, I will be running a task tracker, right? So imagine that there is task tracker running on this machine what is this man ok let me write it no other option Now each machine along it has some data as well because the data node will contain each machine will contain a data node and also a task tracker right. So the data node will hold the actual data as well. So imagine that this is my actual data. And 
what happens is once i create a jar file and i submit it to the job tracker the job tracker will copy this jar file to each of this data nodes okay so it has copied the jar file here to all my data nodes okay so also think that this is also a jar file and this is also a jar file so when i had written my program and submitted it my jar file gets or my jar file got deployed everywhere that means on all the machines now what is the first step then my first map phase starts right so when the map phase is started on the first machine when the map phase got started working on this particular jar file from this jar file it will only pull the contents of my mapper itself so my task tracker will pull only the contents of map and then it will give or it will process it and imagine that this is my mapper output let me give one some other so imagine that this is my mapper output now again the same another part of the program has been working on this particular data and it has pulled the same jar file from here for the map phase to run and it will generate another output so if you compare it with our cards example here it will create where is it right so on my first flapper these are the outputs club 1 heart 1 spade 1 again club 1 diamond 1 so this is my output club 1 heart 1 spade 1 club 1 and again the on the second machine this is my output map output spade 1 diamond 1 club 1 club 1 club 1 so this is again my mapper output and same thing again happens here so now all these will be sent to i mean every task tracker will give a heartbeat to uh, job tracker saying that okay my uh, map tasks have been finished and <coughs> we can proceed with the next one so job tracker will see that every machine have been processed their own map tasks that were assigned to their task tracker and once it gets all the acknowledgements from the task tracker it will say to execute the mapper phase as well but internally and in the inbuilt our structure what happens is first the job tracker will decide like on which machine my reducer has to run because it is having three machines that were running right now but still the reducer cannot run on all the three machines because because the reducer itself is the aggregation of all the three machines output right so it can run only on one machine now once it gets the acknowledgement job tracker will decide and it will say like on which machine my reducer has to run so suppose let's imagine like job tracker has decided to take machine 2 as a reducer machine so it is uh, it has passed a command stating okay run the reducer step on machine 2 so it will pass that command to this task tracker and now once that command is passed what happens is the mapper output of each of the machine will be copied into this machine so all these three outputs so this is actually my intermediate data right so the intermediate data have been moved into this particular machine too and once the reducer phase is done it will generate the final output which is the required one for the client so this is the final output which is required for the client right and this final output once it is it has been produced the task tracker will give an acknowledgement to job tracker stating okay i am done with my job you have given me to do a mapper task so i had uh, got that jar file information from the jar file which you had 
thrown to me. So and I have processed it and I had generated this output. So now the job tracker will take this output and give it back to the end user. So this is what happens internally on the machines. This is how the job trackers and task trackers will talk to each other and process each of the file. So anyone have any questions on this? Or is everybody fine with this? Um, Radhi, I have a question. Yeah. So you were talking about uh, uh, about splits, right? So where does the split happen? So once the once the uh, the job tracker knows, okay, this is my jar file that uh, you know that the user wants to run, and this is my data. So does the job tracker create the splits based on based on the data or? No, no, the input splits were not created by the job tracker. There is something called as input format. So it will generate the actual input splits. But this job tracker will read those input splits only. It doesn't read the blocks. Job tracker will okay. or can understand only the input splits. So there is something called as input format where it will generate the input splits for each of the blocks. So input format is part of the uh, the the uh, the mapper it is uh, part of a it is part of our framework okay so it it happens when you run the mapper class or no no before my jar file is given to my jar tr uh, job tracker all this will happen behind so once okay. the job okay okay fine uh, akshay you are not able to hear my voice or anything else Okay. I don't get. It. Guys, hope you are able to hear me properly. Okay, just let me know if that's not the case. But now we had. Uh, let me explain you one more thing as well. Uh, initially, when you remember. Uh, during the introduction of our big data we have discussed about one topic called as data locality right so can anyone give me or throw me a light on what is data locality uh, hopefully everyone has heard this word but anyone can guess it um does it mean data residing in the same server or uh, not exactly. What is the difference between the Hadoop? Okay, uh, fine, Arjun. Okay, just let me explain. Okay, I mean you are a bit closer to those things, but let me explain you in a better way or in a better form. Okay, so the difference between Hadoop and uh, another technologies is in any of your distributed systems, what we do is we will move the data to that particular machine to get processed but in Hadoop what we are doing is the process has been sent to machine where the data is being resided right so that is the only beauty of Hadoop and that is where we are fetching all this or advantages right because the data is very huge and we are not able to move this data to different machines that is the reason in Hadoop we are moving the process itself instead of the data if you see that old example you are moving the jar file to where the data is actually available because the data is available on that data node and you are moving your jar files right but the data is not moving to that particular machine where your tasks have been processed do you agree that okay cool so that is what the data locality says about so let's imagine this is I am having three racks in my cluster rack 1 rack 2 rack 3 and in each of my rack I will have multiple machines right everyone agrees with me right don't give a shock like what is this
okay so each one is a machine here okay and imagine that my data is available here so first job tracker will see that okay machine one is holding this particular data where i need to run this process so job tracker will try its best to move its map task to where the data is available so it will try to run my map task here itself on this machine itself it will try to run my map task because my data is available on this machine so it is very convenient for me to run where the data is available such that i can assign my map tasks so this is this is the best way that it will try for but if that is not the case and imagine that i am having the data on this machine but still all the maps or all the task trackers that were running on this machine were totally busy and they were not able to take a new jar program right okay everything is doing their job and no none of the task tracker is ready to accept it in that case it will try its best to assign a task tracker to run on this data on the same rack so it will try to see that if any task tracker is available on the same rack such that it can run on this data so if it thinks like okay this particular task tracker on machine 3 of rack 2 is free and it is able to process this data it will just copy this data to this machine and it will assign this map task to run it and in the worst case the data is available here and all the machines on this rack itself were busy in the sense all the task trackers were running completely busy on this rack 3 then the only case it can do is it can assign a task tracker that is running on another rack so it will feel like okay some task tracker on rack 2 on uh, machine 4 is free and it is able to run that data so it will move this particular data to here okay let me keep like this so this is the worst case so in between the racks so the best case is to run on the data that is available on the same machine and the second best case is to run on the data that is available on the same rack i mean to assign a task tracker such that it will it is available on the same rack itself and the third worst case is it will try to shift the data between the racks of the same cluster okay so that is what the data locality concept is about it will try its best to have less uh, less concentration on the network traffic so anyone have questions on this things guys just let me know uh, we will try to wind it up for today and we can discuss much more taking probably we can take one example to do uh, tomorrow and we can see a hands on on that how the map reduce is working what are the things that you will find it on your uh, web interface and on the terminal as well how you will write a program to do some calculation using our map reduce how it look like what are the programs that we write because uh, as of now we had seen like we will be running a mapper program a reducer program and also some main program so we will discuss what each of it will contain and what each of the program a logic has tomorrow so for right now we will wind up with this data and with this information just do let me know if you have any questions
okay fine guys uh, tomorrow is a saturday for me so hopefully if everybody is fine to meet at 7:30 am ist then we can have a class tomorrow so guys is it okay for you 7:30 am ist so probably i think it would be 10 pm for you yes yes arjun so is it fine with everyone so can we go ahead with tomorrow's class sure okay thank you all thank you for joining so let's see and hands on on a single program tomorrow okay thank you guys bye bye have a good night Infosys provides world class online IT training staffing and software testing solutions to customers worldwide H2K Infosys how we are different from our competitors 100% job oriented training hands on project work cloud test lab resume preparation and review mock interviews robust syllabus one time fee and lifetime access to classes access to recorded sessions of live classes H2K Infosys has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kinfosys.com.